Hi, I'm Adam Bennett. I'm one of the directors of Sticks and Glass, a post house here in central Leeds. Um, we've been here since 2018 um, and we're delighted to be part of the Indies Film Festival. Uh, we're quite passionate about sort of talking to young filmmakers, uh, both about post and production. Um, this probably won't be much of a masterclass or a workshop, if I'm being completely honest. Although I used to be a freelance editor, now, you know, running a post house and running a production company isn't qu quite the same as running a project on Premiere or on Resolve. You know, it's a, it's a very different thing. So we're probably not the right people to give you a workshop about, um, about how, to, how to run an edit suite, really. Um, having said that, what we will talk about is we'll talk about why we're here, um, the business that we do, the sort of clients that we have, the different types of jobs that we have. We've got a colleague, Steve Thomas, who, who's been a craft editor for 100 years, and he'll talk to you a little bit about some actual timeline tips and tricks that he's picked up and sort of what it means to be an editor, I guess. Um, you know, certainly as a younger person coming into the business, you might have a, a certain idea of what that is. And unfortunately, you know, clients and briefs and deadlines tend to change what that really means in the real world. Um, it's not quite as romantic as you might think. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, um, about who we are, where we've come on the, in the industry. We've Everyone takes a different route into, into this industry. So we'll talk about, my business partner and I, we'll talk about how we came into it, which will be quite a personal experience and by no means right or wrong. Um, but yeah, it will give you an insight about, you know, the many different ways to sort of try and get your first foothold in the industry, whether you're focused on post or shooting or colour or whatever, really. Um, and then we'll talk a couple of things about technical side of things, hopefully. So, you know, shooting log, shooting raw, shooting HDR, the integration of post and real on-set production and post-production and DITing, the importance of workflow, um, and sound, how you integrate sound into your approach and when to sort of start thinking about those things. So as I say, it won't be much of a workshop, and I apologise if that's what you, you're com you've come here to get the nuts and bolts, but hopefully it will give you an oversight, and if nothing else, it will just give you an idea of who we are and maybe give you a couple of friendly faces that you can reach out to in the future. Hi, I'm Birdie. I'm the other half of Sticks and Glass, um, Adam's business partner and the other director here in Leeds. Um, Thanks for the Indies for asking us along. It's something that we're really excited about. Um, it's not something we've done loads of before, but it's something that we really enjoy. And hopefully you'll, you'll take something from today, some of the knowledge and little stories that me and Ads have got about being in the industry. Um, like Adam mentioned, my career, uh, you know, I've had 20 years as a lighting camera operator. Um, yeah, a, quite an extensive list of every situation manage, imaginable that I've shot in. Um, which might, you know, that's not strictly about the workshop today, which is about post-production, but a lot of it feeds into that and there's a lot of things that you need to bear in mind on the set and while shooting your thing before coming into an edit suite. So hopefully we'll be able to get you, give you a bit of background about the full workflow and journey from, you know, when you're even planning your shoot before you've even rolled a single frame to delivering your final file. Um, before we get into all that, I'll just give you a bit of a background on my career. Um, from the age of 14, 15, I was obsessed with sound, really into my music. I still am. We go to a lot of gigs and listen to a lot of albums and stuff. So I was just obsessed with working in the music industry and all I wanted to be was a sound engineer, either in a studio recording bands creatively or doing sound reinforcement and front of house sound at live gigs. Um, I studied that at college and then a friend of a friend of a friend had a friend who said, listen, we're going to go and film small unsigned bands at tiny little venues. And I thought, well, filming I know nothing about, but the fact that you're filming bands reels really appeals to me. I'll come along and just carry stuff. And I ended up doing that for five years and I didn't go near a sound desk, but I did go near an old miniature DV camera. And before I knew it, I'd kind of got all right at it and uh, you know uh, starting to learn about a few functions within the camera and yeah it, and before we knew it, it it you know I was sort of a cameraman not a good one but I was a camera person um, and I did that for a long time and the business 
that I was working with at that time, that, that just grew and grew and grew. And before we knew it, we were, we were doing all the festivals, a lot of live DVD production that was just taking off at the time. Um, a lot of webcasts, which we now know was streaming, but that was the very early days of the internet. Yeah, I am that old, unfortunately. Um, so I did that for five years and we, and, we, and we filmed some cracking shows and I was working in the music industry and I was really enjoying it. The only trouble was I only knew how to shoot a gig and not much else. And there was a whole lot of camera work that I was really interested in that I'd never done. So I decided to get out of the music live production multi-camera thing and do a bit of studio stuff which I've never done before so from there I went to work at a television shopping channel would you believe which was very surreal a lot of late nights very strange job but also really good and I learned about studio lighting and vision mixing and, and live broadcast which we'd only done bits and bobs of in the music days did that for a couple of years but as you can imagine you do get quite bored quite soon there's only so many pull focuses of a 299 watch face that you can do before you start going you know getting a bit bored so then I wanted to go and do news because I had a colleague uh, an old friend of mine he said the best way as a shooter to expand on your skill set and grow you know the, the kind of things that you'll light and be exposed to is go and do news you'll be thrown in every single scenario and not just your shooting skills your interpersonal skills because one minute you'll be interviewing you know a newly bereaved parent and then you'll be interviewing the prime minister or a, you know a ceo of a big company and you know volatile situations and things like that so i went and did regional news for a couple of years after that um and all the time in all these different jobs you're at, you keep in the network of people who you get on with and you click with and creatively who, you know, the people who are on it and the people, you know, the, the, the way that you like how all the different colleagues work. You keep in touch with those contacts. You'll do it from your course that, you know, maybe from when you were at college or university as well. And that's something that's followed me and Adam through our careers. We have a pool of people that we still draw on now that some some of these uh, relationships were forged, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So after I'd done a couple of years in regional news, that's when I went fully freelance. I'd built my kit up to a level where I could actually go out as a freelance shooter. Um, and after that, yeah, it, it was a kind of a roller coaster, really, of being all over the world, a lot of big global sporting events and... World news events, I did a couple of years, a couple of years, a couple of months in an active war zone when Libya were having their revolution. We went over there doing documentaries for BBC and Al Jazeera. I've done t three Super Bowls now, a couple of Champions League finals, a couple of World Cups. Um, yeah, and, uh, and I really do, you know, after 20 years in the industry, I still feel like I've won the lottery every day when somebody sends me a plane ticket to go and fly somewhere to go and shoot something. I, 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 that's still... I still have that kind of honeymoon period with it. I'm not over it yet. I'm not sick of it. And uh, yeah, I, I, I feel very lucky to have been put in that position. The freelance markets for a camera operator is quite competitive. There's a lot of people um, in the industry all with very similar kit. So by and large, it's a lovely support network. Everybody kind of helps each other out and passes each other work. But you do have to knock down the doors of a lot of places and the work definitely won't come to you. You won't be sat at your desk waiting for your phone to ring. You have to go and chase it. So I remember, um, you know, this was about 15 years ago, literally buying, scraping together some cash for a train ticket down to London. And I had a list of production companies and production managers. And I literally went and knocked on the door and, um, you know, just asked if I could come in for a coffee. And some of them looked at me a bit funny um, and just like, well, we haven't really got anything. We've got our guys that we use. I'm like, OK, well, if you ever need anyone, I'm here. And you know what? Most of them ignored me. But two or three were like, OK, well, that kind of takes guts. I mean, guts that I probably haven't got now, but I did at the time. Um, so, yeah, so I, I would very often travel up and down to London two or three times a week. Um, and swallow the cost of the petrol myself. Now, industry purists will tell you that's a bad thing to do because you know you're saturating the industry and taking work away from London-based camera ops. But I was just so desperate to get into the industry as a freelancer and establish myself as a freelancer. I was willing to sacrifice that and you know literally do 20-hour days, which I'm not condoning because it's probably not safe these days. You know, being that tired behind the, the wheel of a car, but. 
in in those days early on in my career, that was something that I was definitely willing to do, go above and beyond just to make sure I was building up that network and portfolio of clients. So Verdi and I both got into the business about the same sort of time. Um, Ver, Ver, as Verdi said, he started as a cameraman. I sort of started more as an editor. And it was always like my pipe dream to sort of run a post facility. I never thought I would. To be honest, I didn't even realise we ran a post. I didn't realise I'd achieved that dream until we'd been here a couple of years. Um, but that it was actually something that I aspired to have. Um, so I started as an editor. I worked for a couple of independent production companies doing late night television, which um, is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's not it's not that glamorous. It's not that uh, fun. It wasn't working in big teams. It was working very in very small teams where you had to figure out everything yourself. This was also pre-internet, so I was learning to edit with a book called like Dummy's Guide to Nonlinear Edit Suites. Um, it was before Final Cut Pro was ubiquitous. So it was a real, it was a difficult time looking back because we were just figuring stuff out to, with our, our, on our own really. And if I had a problem, I had a couple of people I could pick up the phone to, like one of which was like the kit supplier who sold us, sold the, the production company the kit, who obviously didn't know anything about what we were trying to do. So we, it was really a baptism of fire of just trying to figure things out work out how to put an edit together, work out how to put a project together. And, it, you know, you'd get to the end of a project and you go, ah, oh, I realise now I should have done it in this way. And actually I did that all that round the wrong way. And I actually have been fighting these mistakes the whole way through a project. Um, and so I probably did four or five, six years editing like that, just trying to work stuff out. Um, yeah, and using different software, some software that nobody had ever known. Um, not working in a big team, as I say, so not being able to lean on a graphics department, not being able to lean on a colour department, not being able to lean on a sound department. It was all just about trying to get things as good as they could be, which is probably not dissimilar to what you'd be doing at university, I guess. You do a load of different roles and you try and just make the best out of it. Um, so I, I was a freelance editor after I left those production companies when their work dried up. And I got a diary service, which is sort of like an agency. Uh, they're not really very popular, but I think there are probably still some going where, a, you know, like a big agency might phone up and say, I need an editor for three weeks or I need a, a you know, I need a, a, a sound guy for two days. And, and basically the diary service would take 10% of your fee. So you'd lose a bit of money, but they'd obviously have a fair amount of footfall. So when I was freelance, going freelance in my early 20s, um, it was great for me because I suddenly was just going into the field and I was having to go to production companies, agencies and post houses having never been in there before and being asked to do an edit. So you've never even seen the computer. You didn't know whether you could be working on Mac or PC, whether you'd, what software you'd be using, how the shortcuts were set up. And as I say, this is sort of before we had the internet. So we couldn't just YouTube something or look, look something up. So you were really trying to build up your knowledge of people you could phone up who could help you out in, in a hole and say, what, what do I do with this? Or this thing isn't working, you know, what do I do? Working like that, you know, thank, thank, thankfully we don't have to work like that and there are a lot of resources out there now and, and it's very easy to find people in our business, whether they be experienced or inexperienced, who can help you out. You know, they're, they're sitting there on socials putting themselves out there you know, and you've only got a YouTube something and you'll get the answer. So we're in a really lucky position with that now. But having said that, that sort of baptism of fire teaches you to think on your feet and it teaches you to sort of know that you can't necessarily leave the room until you figure this out, which sounds terrifying even now, really. But yeah, you learn a lot. It's like being in the trenches to some degree, uh, not the actual trenches. It's just sitting in a chair in a computer, but with some some potentially very demanding client who's paying an hourly rate or a daily rate for your time that needs it finished. So I think I wouldn't recommend jumping into the freelance world until you're really ready, to be honest, because you need to be able, you're, as soon as somebody's paying for your time, 
it's your job to be as efficient with their time as possible. No one wants to pay for an editor who's going to spend 20 minutes YouTubing how to do something. And I do think that that is probably a relevant note for anyone out there now. Like, as soon as somebody's paying for your time and paying for your expertise, they want to see you do the shortcuts and do it really quickly. And if you're not able to offer them that, then you have to accept that you're not ready really to be a full freelance editor out into the field. Anyway, I, I digress a bit. So um, that production company, before we, before I left, I started shooting for them, and that was essentially just me picking up that, picking up their camera and figuring it out. Um, and then I started directing for them. And before I knew it, I was shooting everything they shot, I was directing everything they shot, and then I was editing everything they shot. And that included onlining and delivering of masters on tape, you know, on DigiBeta and Beta SP and Pneumatic even before that, delivering masters to broadcast television, which was a terrifying experience, to be honest, because you, you print that master, you drive it to them or get a courier to come. And, and you're waiting for the phone call to ring, you know, before transmission saying, yeah, it doesn't, the sound's not right, or there's a, you know, there's a weird glitch at two minutes and 46. And it wasn't digital files, so we weren't able to quickly do another export and we transfer it to them. So it was a, yeah, it was, it was, it was a terrifying place to be when you were completely over leveraged and overexposed, as I was at that younger age. I, I was really, you know, walking around in the dark trying to figure it out. But it, what it did do is it made me a really good all-rounder. I, I learned very quickly that there isn't a problem you can't solve, whether it be shooting or editing. Um, and yeah, you, 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 you know that you're, you are capable of finding that solution. Maybe you'll be late, maybe it will be a stress, maybe you'll cry halfway through the edit, but you'll probably get to the end of it having delivered that file or that tape. Um, and I think that's a really good grounding for anyone. It would have been nice for me if there was less pressure on it and it wasn't all going to broadcast. But back then, we, you know, we only had five channels in the country. And so if you weren't making tele if you weren't making video for broadcast, who else were you making it for? You weren't not every hairdresser and mechanic had an Instagram page that were willing to you know, who needed video content. Not there were no there were only the big brands in the world were advertising and they were going to advertising agencies and spending two million dollars on a on a TVC. Um, so which brings me to what I did one after I'd been freelance editor for a couple of years, I then joined an advertising agency in London. I joined them sort of as a multi-skiller, an editor, a shooter. I guess they thought, you know, they were getting value of that. Here's someone who can use our camera, who can use our edit suites, can turn jobs around very quickly with a lot of a lot of broadcast PR, which is flying somewhere, shooting something, editing it really quickly, and then putting it out on a satellite truck or getting it out on the news. Uh, which was, again, a great grounding, working to deadlines, not having the idea that you could spend seven months working a project and literally having seven minutes to get it out really sharpens you up. But again, it's a great grounding. It's not necessarily where everyone wants to be. We all want to make beautiful films where we don't have compromise, but you'll never regret having learnt those skills and working to deadlines. It's always going to make you a better operator, really. Um, and then I became their head of production, which was booking crews, booking editors, and just, yeah, just trying to make stuff happen. We did lots of advertising, lots of corporate comms, which I didn't even know about when I was younger, you know. Branding and com corporate comms is a really fertile business that if you're a young film student, maybe you'd, rep you'd think it was selling yourself to the devil. Um, but actually, it's a really great way to sort of earn money, earn revenue, get busy, fly around the world and shoot cool things with different people. If you can make a boring product sexy with video and you can make a really cool 30 second TVC out of a jute bag or out of a monitor, then it really means that you can make cool things then even better. So, you know, so we did lots of stuff with lots of different industries, cars, sports, whatever. And if you can make those things cool and you can add a creative direction to them, then you can do it to anything really. And so again, just getting work, work experience at that age was really, was really great for me. Then, you know, I left that organization and went freelance and, and I've been freelance ever since until me and Verdi started Sticks and Glass in 2018. We, I still shoot stuff with a camera on my shoulder. I direct, I work with other crews. 
Uh, we, we hire crews locally. I work with Verdi. We work with all sorts of people. I sit in with edits. I sit with editors. I sit with producers. And sometimes now, obviously, more often we're sitting remotely where I'm a conduit between a client over in the US and I'm taking their notes and turning that into something that an editor can understand. So, you know, not trying, try, as a producer and a director, trying not to just copy and paste feedback and actually trying to rework information so that an editor can go, right, I know exactly what I've got to do. And yes, of course, I can get that done by three o'clock so we can spit it out and get it out the other door. What a lot of this probably doesn't seem relevant to someone who wants to work in film because it should all be creative. It should all be for the love of the storytelling and it should all be about the lighting. It should all be about, you know, bringing a story to life. But I genuinely think these skills, these practical skills and working in the field are gonna what are gonna be what makes you a sharper operator and a sharper director and a sharper cinematographer and a sharper DOP. You know, the best the best technicians in the world are lucky enough to work just on their tiny niche because they've earned that. You don't start in the industry saying, oh, well, I only do mu really cool music videos. You, you have to have spread yourself quite broadly around so that you can find what your niche is. So three or four years ago, Adam and I identified that, you know, we should probably pool our resources and actually build something proper. And it wasn't just a case of us being a brand. We wanted bricks and mortar and a bit of a hub and a base where we could hang out and, and make some nice stuff. And, you know, people who we've enjoyed working through the years to come and, you know, make some nice stuff here and see what we could do. So at the time we had a big global sports broadcaster who wanted some edit facilities that we helped them with. So they used to come and use us. And we put these four edit suites in. We've got um, DaVinci Resolve for colour grading. We've got a colour special room, special colour room over the way. We've got Premiere Pro on these machines as well as Avid. So they're the, 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 the main three platforms that people want to use. We've got um, some a good few terabytes worth of storage in the server cupboard there. And we're currently looking into a quite a large expansion later in the year on the strength of Channel 4 moving up. So it's exciting times ahead and we think we've just started in our journey and we're, we're really excited as to where it'll go. So from the facility that we've built here, what we can offer to filmmakers is a bit of a sanctuary where they come into this room and they know all the kit's going to work, all the rushes and the footage and that precious time that they've spent out on location is going to be safe and backed up and secure and they're gonna know that they can lock themselves in this room, you know, if you're an editor with your producer or vice versa, and they can crack on and be as productive and as creative as possible. These rooms are quite expensive to hire for a day, you know, it is a commercial business and there's a lot of technology and kit in here. So if people are parting with the hard-earned cash, everything has to work and everything has to talk to everything and, th and they have to know that the rushes, the valuable rushes that have been shot on location are going to be secured and backed up. Um, a lot of our stuff's television and fast turnaround television, so people are often working to tight deadlines, so we have to know when to not knock on the door of the room because we can see that there's two people really rushing towards a deadline and we, we've got to know that the kit isn't going to let them down. We have to know when to knock on the door and bring a coffee in for somebody or go and take a lunch order or indeed go for beers on a Friday night if everyone's had a long week. So it, it is, yeah, we have a, a good variety of clients in here and a lot of it is reading the room and seeing what they're up to and how much support they need, but making sure primarily all the kit works and, every, and all the f footage and data is secure. So yeah, in addition to all the facilities here that we've got in Leeds, um, we also run a production company. So that's Verdi and I shooting together, shooting with other people, working for international brands, uh, doing all sorts really. A lot of our clients are sports broadcasters, so we do a lot with the Champions League, with cycling, uh, with football, the FA Cup, we do a lot with the BBC. Um, and it's great, it takes us all over the world. Um, a lot of it's corporate branded content, you know, let's say a cycling brand wants to produce something or you're working for a broadcaster like NBC or CBS and you're part of their system, or maybe you're pro we're providing kit and people for them, maybe we're taking the whole job on and providing a complete solution for them, including like live IP you know, stuff. But really as a production company, 
Verdi and I, as, as shooters and directors, our, our strength is that we, we know the production, we know pre-production, and we also know what the post-production requires. So we're able to sort of give people a bit of continuity between those three things, which often is quite disbanded, you know, dis, disjointed in that, you know, you do want to have an idea of who is cutting the project before it's been shot so you can have a conversation with that person. And that's all it is, it's having a chat so that they can have their input when there is chance for them to have input rather than you just throwing an edit to someone and them saying, well, why did you not shoot that angle? Or why did you only do it like that? Or what, you know, whatever it might be. So we're quite lucky and privileged in the position that we quite often know who's gonna cut our piece when we're out shooting. Um, but yeah, we, we do lots of different things. It's not really, it, we, we make short films when it comes to sort of documentary storytelling um, and, and that's branded. And these days, you know, you could pick any, any brand on Instagram and make a short film for them. Now, you might not think it is purely creative work because you're working for a brief, but actually, you know, anybody and everybody has a story to tell. And so whether you're the CEO of a, an insurance company there is a story there that will be compelling if you can find what that compelling angle is. Personally, I think that's one of my skill sets is that I can make the most boring thing. I can find what that interesting angle is when there really it doesn't appear like there's anything there and we spend a bit more time on that and pull that out and turn that into the story. So when it comes to filmmaking and storytelling, we, we apply it to every brand. Um, but yeah, there's a brief, there's a deadline, there's a budget and those three things have to be sort of in synergy and you might not be allowed to do everything you want to do and you pull a, pull back a bit here so that it fits within the budget and you pull a bit there so it fits within the timeline. Um, so yeah, we're really lucky, the two of us, because we, we get to shoot a lot. Most of our work is international which and sports based, which was up until 2020 was great. You could have bet your house that every season of of Premier League football was going to happen no matter what and obviously things have changed this year uh, so we've done a few pivots and stuff which have kept us kept us going and thankfully the post-production stuff has continued and we've got people working remotely which means our servers are on even though sort of nobody's here um, and it means that we have to sort of make sure that all of the machines are running um, and that everyone's got the right access to the, the partitions on the drive so everyone can keep working really from a post point. So that sort of changed, changed post-production a lot, I guess, in that we're now, the benefit would be that you can now have a completely international post team working on something. You can have the best colorist in the world working in LA, plugged into your server, working on your footage here, which really in the past, although you could have done it, people wouldn't have expected or allowed it to happen. They'd have, they'd have said it, shit, it will it'll be more trouble than it's worth. But now because of COVID, that remote working and remote logging in has, has become, people have become more savvy to it and actually have realized that it can be at times more efficient. It can be more efficient to not have someone sat on the train for an hour to come in and then an hour on the train to go home and rather spend, you know, jump on it after their dinner for 45 minutes and get something out the door rather than waiting till tomorrow. So we've had a very transformative, transformative year in terms of post-production, in terms of what that means in remote working. Um, and yeah, I think this year we'll see the benefits of it, of it further, being able to bring international people in um, to work through the clock, through 24 hours, which will, again will put stress on us from an IT point of view, but actually from somebody working in the business uh, and someone trying to get into the business, it gives you an opportunity to sort of again find your niche and, uh, and sort of find an area where you can add value, even though you might not be visiting the post house or visiting the set. Adam and I are quite passionate about um supporting people and offering experience to people earlier on in the career um, that's something that we clicked on years ago when we first started working together because although this industry is quite tough to get into it's a, a bit of a misconception that when you're in it it's vast it's not it's quite small actually it's quite insular you know these networks of people you all tend to kind of know each other and just a little story before I go on to that I'm be told you earlier I've been a cameraman for 20 years ago and I remember um, 
been on a shoot, I think it was for the one show or something like that, and there was some there was a runner on that job who was very, very, very fresh out of college. I think I think she was about, you know, 17, 18, and she was doing the coffee run. She was like, you know, guys, do you need a coffee? Do you need anything? I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. And we got on and she was interested in the camera and I showed her around the camera and so I said, all right, cool. And, and, and that was it and I thought no more of it. And then seven years later, that same person called me up and booked me on a job for a BBC sports shoot because she'd remembered me on the job years ago and I wasn't dismissive to her and said, no, no, go away, I'm busy. So my very roundabout point is this, like people earlier on in the career, we, you will definitely meet again. You know, like, it's not like you will see that person at that stage and you're at that stage and, and you both grow like that. Th those people, your, your worlds will, you know, interact again. So me and Adam, getting back to my original point, me and Adam identified a long time ago that we need to nurture and help and support people who are trying to get into this industry, which at times can feel like a closed shop. I mean, it has done to me in the past, I know it has done for Adam. So we're in a lucky position that we've got this lovely facility that we've built and we want to nurture the, 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 the next cohort of young filmmakers coming through. Um, We've got a few strategies for this. Um, obviously, being involved with the Indies is a big one. Um, we, we were super privileged last year to be involved, and this year a bit more in depth. And who knows, next year maybe we can even do this in real life. But that's something that really excites us. Looking at what's been submitted is just phenomenal, and like the the amount of talent in this area is super encouraging. On a totally selfish base, uh, basis, it's like, well, hopefully you guys will come and see us, and we can like collaborate together on stuff so that really excites us um, we've grown some really strong relationships with the local universities the Leeds Arts um, Leeds Arts University Leeds Beckett and the North Northern Film and Television School are all people that we're speaking to and have relationships with because we're just you know these are people who are going to be operating these edit suites you know like we know that and especially in Leeds because Although Leeds does have a rich history in television and film, um, we are anticipating this boom and a big uptake of production and post-production being done in the area. A lot of it's done over in Media City at Salford at the minute. So we will see a vacuum of talent and people who can operate this stuff. So if we can harness people coming from higher education and further education earlier on in the career, that's a big win for us. Like we don't have to go and look for those people outside of the, the region. So the prize that we've offered to the Indies Festival is to use one of our suites for a week or you know maybe experiment with, the, with, with um, our colour grading software and colour grading panel and just have a look around our facility and maybe use some of these high powered computers and to help you with a project that you're working on. Now that doesn't mean the doors are shut to people who maybe haven't been successful winning the prize. Um, me and Adam have got this thing where we hate pulling back the curtain and seeing an empty edit suite. We would rather somebody was in there on that edit suite than it be empty and not used. Now, if you're out there shooting your own projects and your own things and collaborative things that you've done with a friend, if you've got a friend who's in a band and you've, you've offered them a music video, but you're, you know, you've shot it on a camera maybe that you've borrowed and, and your, your laptop's struggling with it, if you're gonna come and knock on our door and just say, guys can I come and have a coffee and hang out with you guys and just see what it's like it you know we're gonna let you use an edit suite come on in like we're, we're happy to have you guys in and that's not to devalue the prize that we're giving away you know that's super important as well and we're not guaranteeing space but if you you know if you're on our network if you're constantly at our door telling us what you're up to and stuff there will be an opportunity eventually where you can go guess what some so, such a project's cancelled go and get yourself in edit five and just see how you get on with avid if you've never used it before or if there's something in premiere that you're not quite sure how to do and one of our assistant editors is hanging out for the afternoon and he's got a bit of a slower day we're going to let him hang out with you and you know have a look under the bonnet of this some of this software and see how it all performs like that that's what me and adam are really passionate about like letting the next generation of young filmmakers in the area use some of this kit and get to grips with it. As a post-production facility, what we're looking for in terms of the skills that we look to bring people in for is sort of twofold. You're talking about very experienced, mature technical operators who have a reputation, who people are willing to pay 
top notch four who come in as freelancers and do their day, do their week. And we might provide those people, you know, we have those relationships, but equally the clients will bring those people in and then we develop our own relationship independently. And then in terms of the more junior roles, we're not looking for specialists, you know, we're looking for well-rounded people who can apply themselves in very different ways. So, you know, we want people who want to be editors, not necessarily people who want to be editors in order to take a stepping stone to be film directors and stuff. We, we like people to be passionate about the post side of things who aren't desperately claw trying to get out of post to get out on shoots, because we have shoots as well. But, you know, I think people who people who fit naturally more in the post world are happy in a dark room on their own, unfortunately, and are happy to work away um, until the early hours. I, I only do good work, well, I don't do any good work anymore, but I am, I'm only productive in the evenings. You know, I'm no good in the mornings. On a shoot, I can do morning, but when it comes to post, I'm quite good working through the night. So I think people's characters in people who are people who are really good or really passionate about post are slightly different individuals from the people who enjoy being out on set and on location. So there's a question there about introvert and extrovert. Really what I want to say is it doesn't matter. We want people who are, who are all rounders. They've got an interest in sound design. They've got a viewpoint on audio. They have an understanding of the full Adobe Creative Suite, so Illustrator, Photoshop, After Effects. Not somebody who can only work in a silo, who wants to be an editor in a part of a bigger machine where the graphics are provided, then it's sent, out, sent to sound design, and which is lovely, and when those big jobs are there, it's great to have that support, but we look for people who can apply themselves across all of those things. We want people who understand workflow and how important housekeeping is how important picking the right codec and transcoding is and building proxies and getting projects ready you know from an entry level position to work in this business in post you're talking about an edit assistant or an ingest or a technical assistant what that really means for us is taking a hard drive from a shoot plugging it in copying it in backing it up backing it up on LTO or cloud or putting it on another drive then transcoding it, transcoding it to lighter files that our editors can work with because maybe they are working remotely. It's having a viewpoint on all of those elements and that's sort of the individual we're looking for. I'll talk about it a bit more later but about the importance of IT. When I started it was all video, that you get video files in, you get video files out and you plug in big decks and you make flickering Im images come on monitors. Now Post is very much an IT heavy industry. We're moving serious amounts of data around. We've got cameras that were launched recently that now do 12K, 12K raw, which even at a Post house, we have to really consider how we deal with that footage. You can't build a facility that is able to take every flavor of, of file in and, every, and everything without any consequence. We have to think about codecs and workflows for every job that comes to us. Has most of it been shot on an iPhone? Is, is there GoPro footage? Has most of it been shot as MXF? Is, it, is there a bit of 4K and a bit of HD? Mate? What is the right balance? What is the right codec for us to work in so that it get, makes the computers work as easy as possible? And then how are we going to approach the onlining process? That's sort of broadcast terms, but the, the same is true of film, really. You're, you're pulling your assets down to something tight so that you can even work on your laptop at home, on your MacBook Pro in, in a coffee shop, and you can do the, do the sort of the creative stuff. But you have to have a viewpoint on how do you get it to onlining? How do you relink the master files? Are you going to have to take those master files to another post house who can deal with it? Where are you going to do the colour? And what's your final output delivery? I mean, if you're just knocking out a high-res HD MP4, it doesn't really matter, right? You can stick it up on Vimeo and you can probably, you can probably apply a lot of that ideology and do it the easy way and keep it in the box and do it do it yourself, but in order to come and work in post-production as a technical operator and, and learn the ropes and develop through it, you have to have a viewpoint that is not, oh, well, I'll just throw it into Premonit or figure it out itself. 
we have to advise our clients on the best workflow and it's not easy and we all make mistakes you know and and you we, you're always learning it's not really a science this business it's it's that ma marry it's that match of like a scientific uh, ones and zeros approach to what works for the creatives you know and what works to give them the best opportunity that they need to 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 focus on the storytelling and the nice stuff so yeah, when it comes to post-production, the people we're looking for are well-rounded. We want to throw them in at the deep end. We want to support them, of course, but we want them, we want to be able to give them rushes, help them make decisions that help the production in terms of, like I said, codec, codex and uh, you know, all of that boring stuff. So that one day when a craft editor is sick or his car's broken down on the way and the client walks in at 9.30, they're ready. They're ready. We're all ready to say, I know that so and so hasn't been able to make it today, but we've got a deadline, and here is our edit assistant who's going to make it work for you. And that is how opportunities in our business come around. You know, it's the same with the camera stuff that Verdi will talk about, and it's the same with Post. We want to create an environment here that enables well rounded 360 development. So that when the job comes in, when the editor is sick or when the, the edit needs to be worked on 24 hours a day or when someone needs a sync lock, someone need, someone's got too much footage that you can't get done within the eight hour day, that that opportunity can then come to one of our juniors. And then guess what? You struggle through it, you're overexposed. But you get through it and that's what gives you the confidence to say, no, I think I could, I am an editor now or I am a, I did do the colour on that thing that went out and it was, everyone did say the colour was good. You do that for six months and suddenly you've got six months worth of professional credits and now a client asks for you again because you did such a great job on, you know, job X, Y and Z. And that really is how the business works. It's about making sure your game fit and match ready for when opportunity knocks, you know, for when there is an injury on the pitch and you're able to take your chance. And we're not all ready at day one. You know, and, and all due respect to all the academic institutions, it, it teaches you a certain viewpoint. But actually for us in the professional commercial world, we, we want people who can rise to a challenge and work quickly, work to a deadline, uh, know how to speak to a client, you know, know how to operate within a room of people who are all chucking their tuppence in on something and know when to be quiet, know when to be affirmative. Those sort of soft skills, soft interpersonal skills are almost the most important thing that we're ever going to look for. And it might be disheartening for some of you, but we are not looking for the most talented person in the room all the time. We are not looking for the next Wes Anderson necessarily. We're looking for someone who can, who can fit into a variety of roles, who can then become the next Wes Anderson and we can help support them with their film and we can help them with our kit, we can get a crew ready for them. When we've got downtime, they can have edit suites and stuff. But we want someone who's, who's sort of, who's sharpening up their skills, who wants to learn about every area of it so that they can sort of succeed in this industry. Well, Adam mentioned earlier that we often need support and help here at the facility. Um, that also happens out on set and on location. Um, sorry to pull it away from being a post-production masterclass again, but I'll just impart my knowledge of what it's like being on the road and on location. Um, there's a host of people that we'll hire in to be on, on a location or on a shoot, from camera assistants, runners, drivers, um, makeup artists, caterers, um, sound recorders, depending on how big the budget is or the scale of the shoot, we'll hire those people in on a daily or a weekly basis, depending on what the shoot is. Um, if, if you're early on in your career, you know, or just kind of coming to the end of education, you're going to be wanting to get on as many shoots or in as across as many of those roles on set and then back here at the facility, working out what excites you and turns you on the most what's the thing that you really get passionate about it's like right that's it that's the thing I want to do until that moment where you have that epiphany try it all like everybody you know starts off early doors going right I want to be Wes Anderson I want to be Steven Spielberg and I'm only going to direct and I'm going to have my mate and he's going to shoot everything 
it's a bit short-sighted. Try it all. It, I mean, if, you, if you've done it all and you've dipped your toe in all of those different job roles and you still want to be that director or that first AD, you go for it. But what you might do is find along the way, well, actually, this suits my personality type a bit more. I get more creative control here. I'm not getting pecked off somebody here. Or it, you might just find a role that you slot into. You go, I didn't even know that existed. And you're only going to find that when you are either on a set or at a facility watching something being cut or edited and how, seeing how the final product is put together. Um, whilst out on the job, um, drawing from my experience, the, the, there's a definite specific personality type and type of person that, you know, that, that I've noticed will succeed and continue to go to other places and continue along their career path. Um, and unfortunately, there's no easy way of putting it, it's just hard work and it's giving up your free time and sacrificing a lot, um, social events, friends' birthdays, all these things that we want to do in our early and mid-twenties. Sometimes you will have to park those things if it means you can get on a job. And I don't know, I mean, when I started out, I did about four or five years without seeing a penny. I was doing three or four bar jobs, I think, at one point, And I was ringing in sick and telling the other one I had another job just to be out on a shoot. Now, I hope, and as an employer and a production company, I hope the industry isn't that exploitative as it was then. It's not a good thing, but that doesn't get us away from the fact that you do have to give up a lot of your free time and there's not a lot of money to be made early doors. So you will have to get stuck in, you'll have to get your hands dirty, you'll have to carry a lot of heavy stuff, there'll be a lot of long days stood round, really cold, a lot of stuff's outside in the winter, especially in the UK. Get yourself some good thermals, a good flask, and just crack on and go and talk to everybody on that set. And then you will come up against people who are a bit frosty. It's like in any industry, there's always somebody who's been there far too long, is a bit too jaded and past it, and is a bit scared and threatened by the next cohort of people coming up. Let it wash over you, go over to the next person, chat with them. Obviously, if they're not too busy, use your interpersonal skills to f measure, read the room, see how busy they are, see if they're receptive to asking you questions. Most people, by the way, like being asked questions about the job. I think it's a, a behavioural science will tell you more about it, but it's probably, it validates what they're doing, and, and I think most people enjoy telling you like, about what they do. Like, a bit like I am now. So go and talk to them, ask them about the job, ask them how they got into it, ask them... Was this the thing they'd always done? Have they thought about another path off of that? Um, and just bits of advice, you know, and, uh, and try and hop around all those different things and see what it is that you like and what you're good at as well. If you're more computer-based or, you know, you're more, you're more techie, then, you know, maybe you are more at home in a post-production facility. If you're more creative, if you're good with photography, maybe a camera, lighting background is somewhere you want to be. If you're a musician, something like that, very musical, then you could think about composition and sound design for film. There's lots of crossover with different jobs that can land in TV and film. You know, it, th there's always a kid in your class at school who was very good at drawing, right? He could now be an animator for one of the, for Pixar or something. There's, a, you know, somebody who was, did a fashion and beauty course at college could now do wardrobe and hair for drama or motion picture. Somebody who is a van driver for Amazon could now run a logistics company that just services the film industry. There's so many different avenues to cross into this industry if you want into it. It's difficult, like we said before, it is difficult to get in, but when you are in, it's not as big as you think, and there are opportunities there. So the most significant way our business has changed in the last decade, really, is how important IT is to us in a facility. I mean, it's always been important ever since we digitised tapes and turned them into digital media. Um, you know, and the sizes have increased. We, we need, need more and more space and faster storage as well. When it comes to skills, we can't really work in a vacuum aside from IT now. Like, yes, we have IT people, but really, whether it be a camera assistant, a DIT, a colorist, a, 
uh, an editor, an edit assister, everyone needs to be IT savvy. And when I say IT savvy, I mean more competent than any of us are, really. We need people who sort of understand the ones and zeros. We need people who understand how different codecs interact on a timeline. We need people who really get how the server is plumbed in and what it means for the facility. So as much as you probably are joining this industry because you want to be creative and you want to make films that change the world, which is what we all want to do, I think in order to take those first steps into the creative, into the professional business, you need to have an understanding of how the IT works. Because I know from our point of view, it would be nice for us to just hire craft editors or just hire colorists. Really, we need people who understand how the infrastructure works because that's where the problems come from. It comes from bad housekeeping, it comes from rogue files, it comes from storage not being set up or optimised the right way. And as I mentioned, we have, to, we have to treat projects in different ways. There isn't really a one-stop or one-size-fits-all to every project. When you get into a rhythm with things, you can have certain established protocols, but with each project, you have to have a different approach. In many ways, film is, e is one of the easier ones because more often than not, all of your acquired content will have been acquired in the same way. It will have been shot on a similar camera to each other's shot. But having said that, if it was a, a documentary film with a huge amount of archive, you could be talking about 20 or 30 different file types that all need to be on, a file, on, on, on one timeline. Therefore, your decisions about codecs, as I mentioned earlier, and how the IT is going to work becomes very important. We're talking about very large files. We're talking about people shooting on SSDs. We're sh talking about the bandwidth that the facility needs to enable the, each edit suite to work at the same time, looking at the same media. We have incoming IP feeds from live events that create growing files that need to be cut on their way in. So really, I do believe the next generation of craftspeople in this industry are all going to have to really understand how the, the IT side works. doesn't mean you need to be a coder or a broadcast engineer, but I certainly feel from our point of view, which is a, a, we are a small organisation, we can't have rooms full of broadcast engineers and then rooms full of editors, like the sort of multi-skilled people we're looking for and that I believe the industry will need moving forward is, is people that understand that back end, which sounds like the boring stuff and, and for a lot of us it is the boring stuff, but I think without that base, without that understanding of the network and the infrastructure, or rather, let me put it the other way, having an understanding of that network and infrastructure is going to make you a much more employable person and less reliant on other people, which can free up your brain to do the nice, exciting, creative stuff. So we touched on there about extracting as much information and knowledge and experience from those people that you're working alongside, you know, when you're, ex when you're in the same room as them, in an edit suite or on set you know, just chew their ear off about, you know, how they got into it. One thing on the back of that, you know, if it's motion picture or drama, it is quite hierarchical, so just be aware that I don't think anyone would thank you too much for going up to the director or the exec from Netflix or the studio asking them how they got in. And so just read the room on that one. Where you will be asked to come back on a job isn't potentially off those people either. It'll be off the people in your immediate circle or which is quite often the case, people on the same level as you. So I think about camera assistants, for example, I've used in the past. You would instinctively think that those guys were quite competitive on who, which camera operator they were working with. It's not the case. They all kind of share work, as camera operators do. So you're going to be asked to come back on a job because somebody who does a similar job to you is unavailable. Either they've got a previous booking or they're not well, and it's like, well, who can do that job? all oh, right, well, I know this guy because I met him once, oh, I know, and this girl was fantastic on this. And it happens like that. It's the smaller, immediate circle that those guys are going to put you on. If you're swinging a boom for a sound operator, keep in touch with the soundie. Don't keep in touch with the director or somebody far higher up the, the, the food chain, as it were. Just keep that network that's in your close periphery, keep that tight and keep updating it and keep people updated as to what you're up to and what you're working on. The people you're going to need to impress and win over are the people in that immediate circle. 
they're going to be the DOP, the camera operator, the sound recordist. They're going to be the ones who p potentially they already have a favourite who they use quite often, but that person might then fall ill or be unwell. So make sure you're on their radar and on their network and you keep them updated as to what you're up to. Within reason, obviously, you don't want to bombard anyone. Nobody wants like spammy emails, but you know, just keep those informal relationships going. Um, when on the job, you know, this is the old famous story that you know I, I've, I've been telling for years and years and years. I could give you now a list of 10 camera operators or DOPs who are infinitely more skilled and talented than I am. Like everything they frame up looks like a painting. The genius, like they see things with light that isn't even on my radar. But they haven't been lucky enough to work on some of the stuff that I've been fortunate enough to work on because they might be a bit too out there or a bit too grouchy or their work ethic might not be as strong as somebody else's. So that's something to bear in mind. It isn't always about, you know, what you're employed on that job to do is how you gel into that team and how you sit on a flight with somebody that you've just met for eight hours or in the back of a van with somebody who you've just picked you up from the station and how you gel and how quickly you bond within that group. Yeah, you're going to be expected to do your job and do it very well, as well as the dude who was on it the day before, but you're also going to have to be fun to hang around and no hassle and you know good fun and good value and good energy on the job. So as much as we want well-rounded people, it's really great to have one of those interests like Verdi mentioned. And, and sound is one of the areas that's quite often overlooked, especially early on in your career. You're sort of just trying to get it right. And Verdi and I having shot in difficult situations, quite often you're just trying to make the best of something or trying to get the sound okay and understand what someone's saying. If you're in somewhere that's very live, you're just trying to make it work. But I think, there is a real career for people who want to focus in on sound and whether that be a location sound recordist which is super fun you get to go on loads of shoots or being you know a dubbing engineer take doing the final polish and sound design on a project whether it be documentary a bit of telly even a you know whatever a youtube video or something that goes out on you know features on cinema releases sound is an area where you can really hone your skills and, and find your niche and there's a lot of different ways you can get into that business or where your interest can come from. So and in post a lot of our job is preparing the file before it goes off to an engineer, to a dubbing suite, to a dubbing theatre. It's about getting your track your tracks laid properly, it's about giving that dubbing engineer all the assets they might need. <clears throat> it's a very expensive part of the business, so it's your one of your jobs is to make it as efficient for that dubbing engineer as possible for them to do their work. And having a conversation with that individual, and well, becoming that individual, but in order to get to that, to that place, having conversations with production about sound design, making sure assets are getting in place. So much of storytelling can be achieved or mood or tone or an unsettling mood can be created with sound, whether it be music or SFX. And I think it's something that you should never, you should always be central to any of your sort of storytelling skill sets or anything, any of your tools, your arsenal that you can tell a story with. Sound has to be up there and treated fairly and treated equally as getting a nice shot and getting it lit and it quite often is an oversight it sounds obvious so the reason I'm saying it is you should sit there and go yeah well of course sounds important but people miss it you know people forget when you're out in the field people say Look, let's just get it done or you know we'll fix it in post which is like we should do a whole chapter on not saying fix it in post because ultimately it's going to cost you money to fix it in post if some if if a, if, if a clip is going to have to sit in a dubbing suite for an extra day to get it fixed then you should have just got it right on the day but I digress my point is I think sound is a is a really important area of of all filmmaking and as more television is made and exported and produced for Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever, you're going to see more and more sound specifications come into normal programming, where it used to always be stereo. Now, normal TV shows are being mastered in Dolby Atmos in 7.1, in 5.1, because they want to sell it to the global streaming players. So I think there's a real area of opportunity there. 
um, for all of us, for us here, you know, we, we, we'd love to build a dubbing suite here in Leeds. Um, but also as the individuals, it's a great, exciting part of the business to get into now, which might be overlooked by many of your peers. So it might be a great way to work on top tier programming and shows uh, that might take you another 10 years to get into if you were go if you were trying to just be there on set with them. Now it's time to get a bit geeky, boring and technical on you, but I'm sure this will appeal to some of you. And once again, it's just my experience from shooting and being on the road as a camera operator and DOP. So the tech changed quite significantly about 10 years ago cinematic cameras and shallow depth lenses became a, a lot more accessible when before we were just used to television cameras um, it allowed lovely cinematic images to be recreated relatively cheap I mean the kit is stummers the kit is still really expensive so what that made it made a lot of uh, filmmakers think more about different aspects of the film making process rather than just slinging a camera on your shoulder and pressing record and seeing what you get which is still you know you still have to have that but people are now more conscious of the longer process and the workflow from shooting on location to delivery a lot of the cameras that we're shooting on like this one we're shooting this on is a cinematic camera which means it'll shoot flat and I'm sure you're all, you guys are already aware of this but that means the colour's going to be added to the image later on um, now it's not uncommon for a DOP, a director of photography, to have a very good uh, relationship with a colour grader or indeed grade his or her own pictures. Um, I don't because I'm useless at stuff like that, but I have a good relationship with our colour grader here who's fantastic. And we sit there and we look across colour palettes and what we both like and, um, and what appeals to us aesthetically and what you like and also you can be influenced say if it's a piece of branded content that brand will have specific colours so you'll maybe want to bring those colours out in the colour grade itself. HDR is another standard that most cinematographers have got to be aware of now so you've got this super high range of latitude between the darks of the picture and the lights of the picture balancing those out you know is quite very specific cameras that you need to harness that and capture both ends of the spectrum that you know that is spitting out some huge file sizes so on location you've got to be very aware of your data management and how you're backing all those rushes up and indeed how in fact they come back to an edit suite um, it's something that you guys should be across because we're just you're going to be seeing more and more of HDR stuff high density range you know super super high resolution files with loads of information going down on the card. So I think one of the more exciting areas of filmmaking these days is documentary films. Obviously we all sit around and binge series on Netflix these days and I think that they can be a great form of activism. I think you can, it's a really aspirational thing to go into filmmaking thinking if I find the topic and I show, spread light on this topic I could potentially change people's opinions and change the world. And I think more, now more than ever I think you know we have a medium out there that that can really be true. Um, in terms of the storytelling that I've grown up with doing, I've found that what I've been very good at is building up rapport with a subject. Now, whether you're talking to somebody about their annual report, <laughs> something boring, or you're talking about someone who's been the victim of a crime, or you're talking about someone who designed something, or you're talking to someone who just won the Champions League or whatever, I think the most important thing you can do is build up rapport. It doesn't really matter how well lit it is, how good the camera is, how big the sensor is, how many bits you're recording, it's more about the rapport and the chemistry that you can build up with that individual so they feel relaxed, so that they get what you're there trying to do. They need to know that you're on their team, that you're not trying to make them say something to look stupid. They need to feel like they trust you. Often we're going into people's homes, you're going into pe places that people, you know, is, it, you're talking about emotional places inside them. And so the ability to put someone at ease and make them feel comfortable is probably, I would say, the, one of the most important skills a filmmaker can have. It's different if you're doing drama, but then you could say you still have to do that with actors. You still have to get 
actors comfortable. And I, I really enjoyed working with actors. I did a lot of comedy when I was younger. And comedy's difficult because people either laugh or they don't. And so you sort of know whether it worked or not. And, quite, and it's difficult to be successful in that, you know. And so working with actors does have a lot of that. But I feel like it's more... It's more mission critical when you're dealing with real people because you're asking them to give away a side of themselves, whereas the actor has offered that up by, by their presence. They're, they're there willing to give you everything. So, you know, I've flown around the world just to conduct interviews. And as I say, a lot of them are very boring. A lot of them you'll have never seen. A lot of them are not interesting. But the ability to go somewhere, have a conversation with someone on camera, Find out what the interesting thing is. You know, ask the question in a variety of different ways to elicit slightly different responses without it feeling stilted and jilted and like you're not having a normal conversation, I think is a really valuable skill. And I think it does appeal to the more extrovert people and it is difficult if you're introverted to make that type of filmmaking. Now, if you can embed yourself with a team or a family or an individual for six months, then obviously that rapport will come out. But it's so important that you have that interpersonal connection. And so I'd say, you know, speak to people on the phone before you go and interview them, get them comfortable with you, have a chat, find common ground, you know. Those few minutes you have sometimes with people while the camera guy is getting ready or by, while the guys are lighting the set are so important. And I've, having been a camera operator and having run a bit of sound and having been an assistant, I can see when people get it wrong. You know, when the subject walks into the room and they're not greeted appropriately, they're not sure who to say hello to, they're, they're not really kept up to date of what's going on in the room. Those moments that you have with the subject when the camera's not rolling are your opportunities to sort of build up chemistry and let them trust you and help help them to trust you. And I think it, it's transferable across all types of storytelling. And I think, broadly speaking, if you're not able to get people comfortable with you, it's going to be more difficult to tell that story. I guess if you're Louis Theroux and you're on camera and you have this awkward presence that sort of makes the viewing compelling, that's great. But it's not going to be a, it's not going to be something that is commercially as useful to everybody that skill. So, if you're thinking about storytelling commercially, yeah, the ability to put anyone at ease, whether they're a president, whether they're a CEO, whether they're a victim of crime, whether they're you know a kid who's won their local swimming championships, that skill is going to be what you need across all of those different types of storytelling to make it work and to help the viewer understand what that you know what that person's story is if you just conduct an interview you know and most of these documentary filmmakers it's, it's it's hung on an interview maybe two or three interviews and we go and get nice pictures to paint it that's really the the formula no one's reinventing the wheel there but it's your job to find out what that interesting thing is so let's let's get the meat and potatoes of this person's story but then let's pick up on the signals, pick up on the micro expressions, ask the question again to find out, to help the viewer get what, what really happened or what, what is behind their story. So forgive me for teaching anyone to suck eggs, but I feel it's quite important that we all realise that it's not about the camera and the lights and the mic, it's about two people having a conversation. Well, more often, more than two people. You know, if we've flown halfway across the world, three of us, to do this interview on a remote Pacific island, it's important that all of us have a good rapport with that person. It's not great to have wallflowers and people hiding in the corners. You've got to be present, you've got to put your hand out, which is even more difficult now, and shake someone's hand and make them feel comfortable that you're in their presence and the reason I'm talking about it is because I think it applies itself to almost all walks of filmmaking whether it be corporate commercial sports news broadcasting documentary drama comedy horror whatever it is it's somebody's job on that set to make everyone feel comfortable and it should be everybody's job to make everyone feel comfortable you should also be quite aware of where your str strengths lie and what your real skill set is. I've always been conflicted from years and years of shooting of, of not listening to the story and, and that used to like turn me up a bit. It's like, oh, I wish I could like self-produce 
or I wish I could see the bigger picture of this. And the reality of that is because I'm worrying about the lighting or what codec or the audio or if my framing right, is it in focus? So I've kind of let myself off on that because it's like, well, I can't be across it all. I get very envious of filmmakers who can see the bigger picture. And it comes from the news. You know, if you, if, you know, my, my, my years working in news, they'd be like, right, we're going to go in and see this person, this person, this person. And I would edit then as well, but I would still need the producer or the reporter to, to go, right, Verdi, you want that clip there? Then come out of that bit, that clip, and that clip. And I used to get envious of editors who just knew the editorial and the narrative and the storytelling without being told. I was very jealous of those guys. But, you know, go easy on yourself if you're like me and, and you don't have that skill. It means you're busy with other stuff like important technical things and focused stuff. And I think, I think that comes from people who are maybe technical or creative or methodical. It's just different personality types. And you'll probably find that you dip, you dip into one of those categories or all of them. Like Ad Adam's definitely more editorial. He can see the story, whereas I can only really see the pictures and the image. So, yeah, just kind of work out where you are and where you live and what you're comfortable with and play to the strengths and have a go at the other stuff. Definitely, like, try it and explore it. But if you decide that you definitely want more than the other, don't linger on trying to be the other one for too long. Let, let yourself go over it. Years ago, when I started, when I was doing the news, there was a big change in the news gathering industry and all camera ops had to edit. Now, we weren't craft editors like the people we have here, but we can knock out a news package pretty quick. So I had to learn to edit. And um, Steve, who's on this call, he, he, I went and did a workshop with him and he imparted all his information. He was very, very kind to me and he taught me how to edit. Now, when I started editing my own footage, I pretty much called up every client I'd ever worked for and apologised because I realised that I was a rubbish cameraman, basically. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I didn't realise I was a rubbish cameraman, but I was like, whoa, hang on, there are whole bits of sequences I haven't um, been getting here. So my point is this, like, if you're just a shooter, go and sit in an edit suite because I, I, I've been very guilty of this and had the privilege of giving over a card or a tape to somebody, a production manager goes, see you next time, and that's it. Whereas actually, when that gets to an edit suite, they're like, Verdi, you didn't get an external shot. You didn't get reverse on this person. You didn't get the detail of that. You didn't get me a sequence around this bit that they were talking about. Because on the shoot, you're just, you know, there's a million things happening, and you're trying to do your job your best you can. But I cannot emphasize how important it is for a camera operator to go and sit in with an editor about and study what you've done on that previous day shoot. And the inverse is also true. I have heard, I've been in edit streets in this very room, in fact, and the language that has been used by an editor and a producer regarding camera operators, I will not repeat. But in defense of that camera, camera operator, that producer and editor weren't on the job that day. Now, they could have had an absolute nightmare. They could have been the car could have broken down on the way there. They could have been denied the access that they thought they were going to get. The contributors could have been awkward. <coughs> Excuse me. They could have had a multitude of things stacked up against them in the, the, to go against that shoot not happening that day, and they were lucky to walk away with something. Now, two weeks down the line, when that hard drive's been sat on a desk for a week and everyone's forgot that stuff, it's like, well, they didn't get me a flipping exterior of the building, and he's useless because look how he's framed that. And little do they know that that guy had just jumped out the car and framed it up just because that was the only chance they had. So be in your box and specialise, but also try and kind of look at the bigger picture of what they could have been up against it that day. And if you are an editor or you are somebody who is indoors all day, get out on a shoot and have a look how it works and look at the things they're going to come up against. And if you are on set and on location, get yourself in your edit in the, ed the place where it's being cut and, and sit with the editor and ask them what they you were short of. Say to that editor, say, what could I have done better that would make that made your job more easy? And they'll always tell you. So although 2020 and 21 probably has not been good for any of us as storytellers or people who want to work in a, in a new industry and go and knock on the doors, knock on doors and look for jobs, it's not a great year for any of that. What we believe is in passion projects. It's like find a group of mates, 
It doesn't matter what camera you're shooting it on. It doesn't matter what the lighting is. Shoot it in natural light. Shoot it on whatever camera you've got. Shoot it with people and learn your, learn your craft yourself. You learn more from being on a job even though that job isn't paid, when you give yourself a deadline, you say, I'm going to I'm going to shoot on it Saturday, Sunday, and I'm going to edit it until the following Friday, and then we're getting it out the door. What I would say is give yourself deadlines and get it finished. And don't work on something infinitely for the next seven or eight months because you search for perfection, and perfection doesn't exist, and it's subjective. And ultimately, no one will thank you for learning perfection really slowly. There, there is a place for that personality in the industry. There, we all would love to be in that place, but for most of us, we have to be technicians and we have to work. And in order to work, you've got to get out in the field. Never has there been a more accessible time. You know, the kit still does cost money. You can edit on your phone. You can edit on your laptop. You can shoot stuff on your phone. You can get a DSLR. You can borrow a lens. You can borrow a mic. The kit there is now, it's not like it was when we started, when you had to buy a 50 grand computer and you had to buy a 40 grand camera. You can do it now, and not to say there's no excuses, because you've still got to get motivated and find some people who want to make a project with you, or you do something on your own. But really, you've got to just get out there and, and start making stuff and then send it to people and send it to us. And now you might, you might send us our, your CV next week and we'll say thank you very much and you'll think oh well that was that was rubbish they didn't give me a job but if you then follow that up six months later with oh I just thought you might be interested in this short film me and my friends made and we message back yeah it's great thanks for sharing nothing comes from it you do that two or three times eventually and you do it across a hundred different people that you know eventually the timing might work out for you and nepotism is a terrible word, but it's not that I only, we only employ our cousin. It can be as simple as your email landing on, our, on the desk at the right day when we were suddenly looking for an illustrator and you sending us the new illustration you just did. Suddenly now you're in the room. It's all about the opportunity and the timing. So you have to be persistent. And I know that's a cliche across every industry. Keep trying, keep being persistent, but keep making stuff and share it with people and ask for their feedback. And guess what? If you've, if you've sent your six short films to us in a year and every time we've, we've watched it and said, that was really good, well done you're going to be in our mind you know and if you just send us one cv once when we were not hiring when we were not busy we you won't necessarily be front of mind it is about creating the opportunity to get in the room with the right people you know and not everyone you meet has a job you know not everyone has that thing commissioned but in six months they might so did you work hard enough when you were a runner on that job for free so that when that person gets the next job, which is paid, that they want to employ you or do they want to employ someone else? You've got to keep being persistent and trying and making sure that you're front of mind. And it is difficult because we all it's too easy to procrastinate and sit around and think, oh, the, you know, there's nothing out there for me and I can't be bothered to make this passion project. If someone has a good project that we like the sound of, that we know fits within our skill set, where we don't have to completely reinvent the wheel, and someone's not pit pitching Avatar 4 to us, but we can see how something can fit together, and we like the story, we'd get involved. We'd send, we'd, we'd go out and shoot it with you, and we'd bring it back here and do post on it. We enjoy passion projects. Nobody loves to work for free, but if we have creative control of something, then it, it creates something that you can then go off and share. And maybe we share it with our clients and we say, we just made this because if it's made well enough, it's something you can share. So I guess to summarize what I'm saying is you have to keep being persistent and you know, you have to make your skills commercially viable. You've got to work, learn how to work fast. You've got to learn how to work to different briefs. And not everything, unfortunately, is just what is creatively the best. It's got to be practical. And you've got to keep trying until the timing can work in your favour. You know, your CV has got to land on your, or your new film has got to land on the desk on the day that that individual is looking for someone else to take this project off their hands. And that's how it works. And until that timing comes, you've just got to keep ploughing on and keep making stuff. Um, so yeah, we're Sticks and Glass. Look us up, send us an email. 
Uh, we're always happy to talk to people. We, we, we want to be part of the Leeds young filmmaking community. And if we think we've got anything that we can offer you or help you with, reach out to us. You never know if uh, that conversation happens on the right day. So that's us, Sticks and Glass. Thanks very much for joining us. Sorry it's been in this weird virtual thing. Hopefully next time we can do it in real life. Um, you're going to really enjoy what Gemma and Steve have got to say. They're infinitely more knowledgeable and easier to listen to than me and Adam. Um, keep in touch with us. Drop us an email. Follow us on Instagram, stuff like that. and Let us know what you're up to. Thanks very much for again and enjoy the indies. <laughs>